Let me start the session. And uh, my name is Shigeo Sigimoto. And uh, do you hear me well? Okay. So then uh, let me share my <clears throat> introduction slide. Okay. So the this slide, this panel is titled Metadata for Visual Media Arts, the manga, comics, game, animation, and so on. And so the, we have the four panelists. Um, the, the first one, uh, this is ordered by alpha, alphabetical order. And Jin Hali from the University of Washington, and the Iki Omukai from the University of Tokyo, and Sean Petia from Kent State University, and Magnus Pfeffer, Stuttgart Media University, Germany, and myself as um, Shigeo Skimoto and uh, from University of Tsukubata. I'm a retired professor. And then, so this is backgrounds. So the, there are really uh, various uh, visual media artworks and uh, manga, comics, video games, animation, and so on and so on. And so these, I think these artworks have significantly different features. And um, that is quite different from the traditional cultural objects such as a painting, sculptures and books, uh, printed books. And they are quite image centric, dynamic, interactive, multimedia franchise and etc. So the uh, actually the manga and video games and animations are connected by some as multimedia franchise or the, say the characters. They are the quite uh, interesting features of the visual media artworks. And so today we have four panelists and uh, they have been doing the very interesting work in their areas. And so the I gave some questions to them and what features need to be described by metadata and how can we use descriptions in the network information environment? Item centric, content centric, user centric, something like that. And so here's this agenda. The first speaker, first panelist will be Jinha Lee. Jinha will talk uh, actually, she has been quite active in the game metadata, video game metadata. And here, she will talk about the impact of transmedia storytelling on information organization. And um, the second speaker, Iki Omukai, uh, actually, he organized, um, uh, recently, he organized a digital humanities conference based at Tokyo. and they he has been involved in the Media Art Database project founded by the uh, Agency for Cultural Affairs in Japan. And uh, that database is um, a kind of a metadata database for manga, anime, video games, and the new media artworks. So the, he will talk about the unified model for media art databases. And also, the, I, I'm thinking that he will mention about it his experiences for the interaction, user interaction, and also the modeling things. And uh, okay, but some errors on this, uh, actually, the third speaker, Magnus Pfeffer, he has been leading the uh, large project in Germany. Uh, that project is um, titled uh, Visual uh, Japanese Media Assay. Uh, Anyway, he will <laughs> say that that topic, uh, the title of the project, and the uh, enthusiast models of the Japanese visual media domain is his topic. And then the fourth speaker is uh, Sean Petia, and uh, he will mention about the graphic medicine and LOD, semantic enrichment of mental health comics metadata. So the, these presentations will include some user or the audience issues, 
linked open data issues, but uh, all of them are based on the I'll say visual media or visual media artworks. And uh, I'd like to introduce Jinha as a first panelist. Jinha, are you ready? Yes, I am. Let me okay. share the screen. I, yeah, Am yes, I... please. All right, can you see the slides? Yes. Perfect. All right, so uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jin Ha Lee. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Washington Information School, and I oversee the lab Gamer Group, which stands for Game Research Group. And today I'm going to be presenting a case to illustrate an example of participatory fandom and transmedia storytelling with the goal of perhaps inspiring all of us to think about what this all means for organizing popular cultural objects. So I want to start the presentation by briefly introducing our lab and what kind of work we've done so far. Um, at the Gamer Group, we work on many different kinds of projects related to games, uh, but one of our main shared themes of research is exploring new ways for organizing, preserving, and providing access to video games. A core question that guides our work is, how can we provide more intelligent access to video games? And our previous research effort has focused on creating a metadata schema and relevant control vocabularies so that we can capture the essential information about games in a standardized way as a possible solution. We employ a variety of different methods, um, including some user-based methods, uh, document-based analysis, as well as doing data modeling. I would say probably the most important aspects of our research is this focus on users. So we do make efforts to really think carefully about how our end users might want to find and use these media objects. Uh, one of our most important outcomes of our game organization work is probably the creation of video game metadata schema or VGMS. Um, and this is a result of a multi-year project starting in um, 2012 uh, involving hundreds of collaborators. And this schema, which consists of 59 metadata elements and 10 control vocabularies, is available on the Youth of Gamer website for um, any individuals or organizations interested in adopting it and using it. We also had a spin-off project collaborating with Video Game History Foundation, where we explored how to better organize not just games, but all sorts of artifacts that are created in the game development process to help preserve the historical context of video games beyond just saving the games themselves. We interviewed 29 people who represent the, uh, three different stakeholders, uh, so game creators or information professionals like librarians or archivists or game researchers. And we also examined five different collections of development artifacts and as a result, we also created this taxonomy and best practices guides for the three stakeholders. And these are also available on the Gamer Group's website as well. Now, one thing that was really you know, becoming evident as we were broadening our research to investigate all of these game-related materials was that so many of these popular cultural objects are very closely connected to each other. And existing knowledge organizational systems don't always do a great job of showing these connections. Um, in addition to doing all this game and game related material research, I happen to also do a fair amount of research on popular music as well, uh, investigating similar kinds of questions as to how to best organize and provide access to music. And recently, I wrote several papers on the participatory nature of music fans, specifically investigating the fan community called ARMY, which supports BTS. And what's been really interesting to me as a researcher in knowledge organization was seeing how these various connections among different popular cultural objects were influencing the ways people seek and engage with music and appreciate it. Uh, now, BTS is so massively popular. Uh, I don't think, I think everybody knows BTS, or at least you heard about them. 
Uh, but if you don't know, BTS is a Korean music group with seven members and currently the biggest music band in the world. Uh, the ARMY fandom, which supports BTS, is a huge global community and it's well known for their strong presence and impact on social media. So what I'm going to do today is share this concept of Pangtan universe, which is a prime example to show how well BTS does storytelling using multiple media to prompt us to think about how this affects the organization of popular cultural objects. And this might be something surprising, I guess, to those who are not fans of BTS, but they do this wonderful, complex meta narrative, multi-platform storytelling um, in a music that hinges on delivering different pieces of narrative using different media platforms. And each one kind of complements each other. So that means oftentimes you need to consume the media in one platform to make sense of the other media. And you really need to consume everything if you truly want to understand the meta narrative. Um, the concept of Pangtan Universe or BU started when the most beautiful moment in life or a Payang Yeonhwa series came out in 2015. So of course, at the center of everything, they have their music, uh, which was released in two part albums. And this was accompanied by a series of videos such as various music videos, trailers, teasers, et cetera. And all of them contain different visuals and different parts of the overall story in the Pangtan universe. Um, in this fictional universe, uh, seven characters that share the same name with the BTS members all have some kind of traumatic past experience affecting their current mental state and behavior. Uh, now you see in the first image at the top that the member J-Hope is laying on hundreds of chocolate bars in the music video of Fake Love, which on the surface may seem like, oh, maybe it's portraying the toxic pleasure from love. But once you watch the other videos, you realize it has a very specific meaning as he was abandoned when he was young uh, at the amusement park by his mother, who left him a chocolate bar with him, which results in him having this trauma associated with the object. And later he suffers from mental health issues as an adult. And these videos are all related to each other. You can see these connections that are represented in objects like pills or representation of the member J-Hope as a patient across all these different media. Now, the tricky thing about these connections is that there's usually nothing in the way they are labeled, published, or described that actually makes these connections evident. There's no metadata. So you only know about these connections once you engage with all the media content. And additionally, there are several types of printed materials. So Huayang Yanwa Notes 1 and 2 which started with the notes included in the album booklets. Uh, they were later published in these two volumes of fiction in multiple languages. And even before that, the fans were already volunteering to translate the notes in Korean and distributing them through multiple websites and social media. And there are also five graphic lyric books with visuals for different songs and a webtoon, Save Me, which shows different episodes of the members. Now, these fictional elements are sometimes show in ways that are like very ephemeral. So for instance, there's this flower called Smeraldo, which is a fictional flower. It doesn't really exist, uh, but it is a key object in this Pangtan universe narrative. And one day BTS member Chin posted this tweet holding those flowers with that name Smeraldo. And one, once fans started searching the internet with the keyword Smeraldo, they discovered that there is this blog which appeared to be managed by a flower shop owner who sells this fictional flower. And there were already several blog posts at the time of its discovery. Uh, now, what's interesting here is that in this blog, the nine posts that were made in 2017 were suddenly all deleted and re-uploaded in 2018 with two more posts, but the story had actually been changed in multiple parts. And that is because the character Jin in Pangtan Universe actually has this ability to time travel. And every time he goes back in time, the events in the story supposedly change. 
So that's why the blog posts have also changed. But that means the original content is now gone, uh, which creates challenges for organizing these kinds of materials. And the only record of it is the screen captures or recordings from users before the content actually changed. And because the Pangtan universe is really multifaceted and very complicated, fans have various interpretations of what is actually going on in the narrative. And they produce BTS theories, and you can find many of these theory videos on YouTube. Uh, there are also many fanfic writers and artists who produce fan art based on this story, which requires their own organizational scheme. There are also multiple games related to BTS. Uh, the one that is probably most relevant here is this one called um, BTS Universe Story, where part of the Pangtan Universe narrative is told, but also the game offers a platform fans can use to produce their own stories using BTS members as characters and share them with other fans. So here's a, a screenshots to show how the fans could make use of these characters to build their own stories. And in all of these examples, I think what it shows is that um, BTS is, you know, in BTS's transmedia storytelling, the role of the fans is very important because they're the ones who contribute to in essentially completing the story, right? By sharing their own interpretations, finding all of these clues and connecting the dots to understand what BTS is trying to tell us. And while we're talking about games, I want to show you another interesting example to further illustrate my point. Um, here we have BTS Island in the Sum, which was a mobile puzzle game featuring BTS characters launched earlier this year. When they released the game, they of course released behind the scene videos on YouTube uh, where they showed how BTS members themselves participated in creating the game. So of course we have these relevant video materials, but more interestingly, um, many of the scenes that are featured in the game itself are inspired by the past activities of BTS shown in other media. So in this example, you see that uh, on the left side, there's a game scene where these members are playing this foot volleyball and they're completely struggling, uh, which is actually based on the episode 100 of the variety show Run BTS. So for the fans, you know, these kinds of connections are important and meaningful and prompts different kinds of search needs for these media objects at a much, much more granular level. Sometimes these connections not only exist among the digital media, but bleed into other types of art or events in the real world as well. So the last example I'm gonna show you is the project called Connect BTS, where BTS selected and presented these curated art exhibits by 22 artists in five different countries that resonated with their artistic vision and philosophy. And while I don't have time to go into details about this massive project, um, here are some examples to show how these exhibits uh, in the virtual world or real world connects back to the music videos and performances of BTS. Like here, where you see the scene of on music video at the bottom that resembles the atmosphere in the virtual experience catharsis. Or the scene in uh, Interlude Shadow trailer that is inspired by this green, yellow, pink, and beyond the sea uh, scene exhibit in Korea. And these projects not only blur the boundaries between real world and virtual and high art, which are sometimes treated differently in terms of organization and description of materials. And beyond the examples we saw, there are, of course, many different kinds of materials, including both digital and physical objects that are really related to BTS. And some of these IPs um, actually also contain different stories, such as the BT21 characters shown here, or Tiny Tan characters. And there's also a substantial collection of academic articles and books related to BTS. So from the perspective of a fan, you need to have a way to find all these materials and understand the overall connection and the narrative embedded in their music and other materials. 
uh, based off of these relationships, which means we will need a pretty complex organizational or descriptive system. So in these examples, I think what's evident is this prevalence of participatory culture and the important role of fans. Um, fans who deeply engage with the materials are not just passive consumers, but they're also producers and creators of these media. So they're the ones who really know them. And because of this reason, I would argue that they're probably the ones who are most suited to organize these materials for other uses as well. So then the big question for us is how to best work with fans or incorporate their work that's already been done in libraries or other cultural heritage institution. We may ask questions like, you know, what kinds of metadata are necessary to adequately describe these themes and connections across multiple media? Or what kinds of relationships do we need to define and specify among all of these works? And uh, I believe my colleagues in this panel will actually showcase some really interesting projects as examples to show how it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Jinho. So can I move to the next speaker now? And uh, we can take the questions and discussions after the old presentations. Okay, then. Let me introduce Iki Onkai. Yes, so can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, so yeah, yes, uh, I can hear you. Okay, so let me share my screen. So yes, please. Okay, is it okay? Okay, so thank you for your introduction. And uh, my name is Ikkyo Mukai from the University of Tokyo. Uh, now uh, in Japan, uh, 7 a.m. So, so very sleepy, so, but uh, let's start. So my presentation title is Unif uh, Unified Data Model for Media Art Database. And so first of all, I would like to introduce the Media Art Database. Uh, this database is operated by the Agency of Cultural Affairs of the Japanese government. And this database contains information on four different fields, which are manga, animation, uh, digital game, and new media art. Uh, these domains are specified by law with the agency. The first version of the database was released in 2015 uh, later, I joined the project and designed a beta version, which was released in 2019. Uh, in last year, the MADB lab was started to publish the data set and the sparkle and the point. And uh, here is the Media Art Database website. Uh, you can choose from four different interface language. So let me put uh, Pokemon uh, uh, as an uh, example. So, okay. so you will see the such results of several works arranged in chronological order. Uh, here, uh, yellow text shows uh, indicates animation, uh, green shows games, and uh, red shows manga. In the, uh, the so uh, click on a single entry to see detailed metadata. And now, so uh, main, most of metadata entries are already in Japanese. So currently, the database contains half a million entities for manga and over 100,000 for animation and 48,000 for games, and 14,000 for new media art, for a total of 700,000 entities in this database. Uh, each field has completely different data format and the distribution channels and for works. Uh, for, for 
example, uh, in, in manga, uh, there are works that are published directly in a book form and others that are serialized in magazine and magazines. Uh, manga published in magazines are later compiled and published in book form. Uh, and the popular works are sometimes made into the series. Uh, in animation feed, uh, animation is a, an even more complex situation. And uh, some works are broadcast on TV and some are played in the, in the theaters and others are uh, sold as a package from the beginning. Uh, later, film may be shown on TV or as a package. In the field of the video games, uh, there are multiple platforms such as PlayStation and or uh, Xbox, and a much, a multiple packages are produced for these platforms. Uh, recently, uh, digital versions are often sold at the same time, making the situation more complex. Uh, the media database obtains these diverse data through partnerships with libraries, universities, and industry associations. Uh, we then design a, a unified data model and transform the data to enable uniform access to the public. Uh, this data model is intentionally designed to be flexible and rough in order to absorb differences among fields. There are only two fundamental classes, uh, items and corrections. Uh, let's use Pokemon as an example. Uh, the first Pokemon was released as Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue. Uh, and that, uh, the Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue are defined as the instances of the item class. Uh, instance and uh, item class respectively. On the other hand, we consider red and blue to be one series. And therefore, uh, we create a resource containing red and blue and uh, define that the instance of the collection class. And the collection and the items uh, are linked, linked to each other using a schema is part of a uh, profile. Uh, the same framework, same framework can be used to represent manga information. Uh, for example, Naruto uh, consists of 72 individual books. Uh, each, each book is defined as an instance of the item class, uh, um, volume one and volume two. Uh, and the entire works are set of 72 volumes is defined as an instance of the collection class. And collections are also used to define the relationships between works. The fact that Pokemon in the game field includes multiple series can be expressed in the form of a collection of collections, like this. Uh, uh, like this. Uh, it is also possible to define a concept that includes Pokemon in games and animation uh, yeah, using uh, this uh, collection classes. The data created based on this data model is provided uh, by the Sparkle endpoint. Uh, this endpoint contains and 27 million tulips. And the data is described in detail using 180 properties. Uh, so, so you can try uh, that uh, endpoint. And like this. Uh, so now, so we need to discuss definitions of the fundamental classes. So what is item? 
So my opinion is that it, it depends on who created the data. Uh, the information on a manga is create, created by the librarian who catalog the books. So librarians consider a book to be an item. So animation information is created by TV stations and the content distributors. So in, the, in this case, it's, uh, one item is mapped to one TV program or one uh, product, such as so discs or cartridges. And the game data is created by researchers or uh, archivists who collect discs and cartridges. Therefore, uh, each, one of the, uh, each one of the different packets uh, for each platform is considered an item. And defining an item in new media earth is extremely difficult. So it varies greatly depending on the form of the work and requires the judgment of the curator. Uh, for collections, the concept of series for each field is relatively easy to define. Uh, so most instances of collection in the media as database represent series. On the other hand, so there is no professional who can define a resource that across the full field and add values to the data. So a new type, cura new type of curator with multiple expertise is required. So other challenges for the media art database include dealing, include dealing with born digital works. Uh, there is an ongoing discussion about how to collect information on media that have very different forms and distrib distribution methods and streaming media, and webtoons, and smartphone apps. So in addition, a number of unclassifiable works is expected to increase. An organized information management systems is necessary for the continuous maintenance of uh, our database, but it is it's not clear how to capture the uh, unique activities. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. So thank you for, uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much. So the, <clears throat> the actually I, I, I'm also involved in this uh, media database project, but um, I, I found the definition of the item or the content was a uh, quite a big issue for this project and um, so let me move on to the next speaker, uh, Magnus Pfeffer. He is leading a JVMG, the Japanese Visual Media Graph Project. And um, so, the, Magnus, are you ready to start? Yes, I'm ready. Just yes. a second. Okay. Slides, it's with one screen, it's always a little bit difficult. But you should now see my slides yes. working. Yes. Wonderful. Just make the image of the audience a bit smaller. And thank you for the introduction, Professor Sugimoto, dear colleagues. Uh, today I'm going to talk about enthusiast models of a Japanese visual media government. And in order to do this, I have prepared a few bullet points on our project so you know what we are working on and what we are trying to achieve. Um, as part of a project, we are working with enthusiast communities and I will share with you how they organize their own databases in they created. And I have a few observations uh, we made during the project and some the influences the enthusiast work had on our own understanding of a domain and modeling of a domain. Just to shortly introduce the project, it is a research project which has at its core goal the idea and started by the observation of uh, fan and enthusiast communities on the web, collecting huge amounts of data on Japanese visual media, which is usually provided on forum type 
web community type website is distributed across multiple communities, but is extremely interesting. And as we have seen before, it is very hard to get a comprehensive picture of a Japanese visual media domain. The idea of a project is to um, utilize this work the fans have put into their own databases and collections and create a large scale quantitative research able database targeted explicitly not at the public or the interested uh, consumer, but researchers. We had this idea, I think, in 2016, 2017, and proposed this to the German Research Foundation, and we got funded for years. We are now in our third year of funding, and the project is winding down. We are hoping for another extension right now. During the project, we contacted uh, multiple enthusiast communities and invited them to workshops to discuss collaboration. And in this presentation, I'm going to show three representative communities that we have been working with. The first is the Italian community Anime Click. They have a broad interest in Japanese visual media, Japanese media, Japanese culture, Japanese food. They have forums, they have fan participation, they have a ton of activities centering on everything Japanese. And of course, also for manga and anime, there is a lot of information available. But other communities are quite different. The second example is the Visual Novel Database, which uh, has a very strong focus on a single niche genre of visual games, which are the visual novel games, which are very specific for Japanese visual media. Many of these games are erotic in nature, and these, this community has created the most comprehensive database to our knowledge for this type of game. The third community has a completely different focus. It's the anime characters database, and they are fascinated by the variety and the multitude of Japanese visual characters. They have started to create a database to categorize and catalog the appearance of visual characters in media. We are not only working with uh, these enthusiast databases, we are also uh, trying to enrich our knowledge graph with data from Wikidata, where it's feasible and sensible. And we are also closely observing the media arts database because their approach to collecting the data from bottom up from individual items and then creating collections, as we have seen in representation before, um, very nicely uh, substitutes the data we get from the fans, as you will see in a second. So given that these are the communities we are working with, how do, do the data models look like? First of all, it is important to notice in the data models, all communities created actual databases. So they picked an entity relationship model and they decided to create entities for specific things they observed in the visual media domain. Creating an entity instead of just having a string literal is very beneficial for retrieval because once you have made entities of creators, you can do things like find all work by a creator and are not limited by some weird string comparisons. You can simply find the entity connected to the works and follow the connections. And the same holds true for find all characters that share a set of traits or all media that share a set of texts. Also, Creating explicit entities for people involved in the production and the media works itself allows you to de describe what is, uh, the, the relationship between these two entities in detail. So you can tell about the role of a person in the media creation or a role of a character. Let's have a look at the examples of the data models. This is the visual novel database. Remember, they are focused on a specific type of computer game. And if you have a look at this quite complex model, you need to find a starting point. And in the bottom right, you will see they have an entity they call visual novel, which is, if we compare it to the media arts database data model we have seen before, an abstract collection, or not really a collection, but an abstract entity that describes the game as a non-corporal thing. Corporal thing 
disk you can buy the download you can uh, maybe buy somewhere on Steam that's called a release and the release is created and provided by a so-called producer which is usually a company or some other entity in the commercial domain. They also focus a lot on the staff involved in the production. So every visual novel is a long list of staff involved in its creation, both programmers, graphic artists, seiyu, which is voice actors, uh, are noted. And given that uh, the domain is famous for its visual characters, characters are their own entity class, and they are further described using traits. There's also a tag hierarchy that describes the visual novels in detail. Trait and tags are mostly subjective information collected by the fans that try to organize visual novels according to genres, themes, and topics. And traits are also subjective or so observed traits of the characters in the game, like their behavior their look and their actions. Anime Characters Database, as the name implies, focuses strictly on the visual characters, so they are the core of a data model. They have created character entities that are further described by character text, which is again full tag hierarchy. They have a very simple approach to uh, work hierarchy. They simply connect each character to one or more media work, which can be both manga, game, or animation, or something else. Again, a tech hierarchy is provided to further describe and compartmentalize the works. And this community also has created entities for people involved in the character. Here, it's mostly voice actors, as they are focused very on the character. It's not character creators. And the third example is the Anime Click Italian community. As I said before, they have a very broad approach to the, their interests. So they cover both animation works and comic works and the stuff related to these works and the visual characters. But unlike the other two communities, there is no separate tech hierarchy that is used to describe either works or characters. One needs to understand that for fans to decide to create a full entity for a specific part of the domain is an incredible amount of work. So the decision to, do we really want to have a, a table in our relational database model that covers a specific aspect of a domain, or do we just Note the information in a simple field as a string is not an arbitrary decision. It is one that is taken with great deliberation and care because all these questions of database design might be just a burden on the programmers. But given that you want to avoid duplications and false connections, as soon as a community decides to create an entity for a specific aspect of a domain, it needs to enforce editorial control on this aspect. So once a community decides to give people not only as a string, but as a, an entry in the database, someone needs to take care that people don't get multiple entries or the wrong people get connected. Also, the concept hierarchies need continuous development to include new concepts and to enforce usage guidelines. Even with these three uh, examples from the presentation, and we did have a look at many more uh, enthusiast communities, it is quite easy to see that the core and common entities are very similar. All communities decided on a triplicate or a, 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 on three main core entities. There's media, there's people involved in their creation and production, and there's visual characters. Some, but not all, have additional concept hierarchies to further describe media and visual characters, which is, of course, of course, very good for our project. Then, as in our project, we want to include the data from as many communities as possible into a single knowledge graph. And if they would 
model would domain very, very differently, merging the data would become really hard. In our case, this looks like this. If you have a look at the numbers of concepts and entities in the different databases, you will also understand why we are so fascinated with the work of the enthusiast communities. If you just have a look at the column for characters, you will see that each of these communities, even though some of them are not really that focused on visual characters, have more or almost 100,000 individual fully annotated entries for visual characters. This is very impressive indeed. And also, if you see for the more specific information on the media works, you will see that the VNDB niche database has found almost 30,000 different games that have 72,000 different releases. Also, a nice comparison given we had uh, some numbers in the presentation just before, you can now see that the anime click and ACDB databases have a limited amount of information available on comics and animation. And Media Arts Database has much more than they have. As we heard before, the problem is that there's physical objects we can buy or at least think we can have as abstract works and then various larger franchises. And the communities treat these, these three layers differently. The VNDB covers the bottom two layers. They religiously mark releases as physical objects, discs, CDs, DVDs, and in their case, non-physical objects like download opportunities or digital distributed media from distributors and the abstract work. Anime Click and ACDB allow for clustering media into media franchises in a similar way we've seen in the presentation before. So they cover the top two layers, but they don't care at all about items. We heard of Media Arts Database, which works bottom up from the physical objects towards the franchise. And Wikidata, which we also observed, is very fragmented and has no clear agreement on how to deal with the object and work. Not obvious from the data models is a problem that is inherent in media works themselves. Not only do we have a problem of physical release versus abstract media, but also the granularity of this media is not clear. Specifically, in our case, TV series are broadcast in order, and we may know that it has 39 episodes and it was finished, but are these three episodes of 13 episodes, uh, three uh, seasons of 13 episodes each, or is this one TV series with 39 episodes? What about special episodes, Christmas episodes? for example, or other special opportunity recollection episodes to help people come back into the TV franchise after an, a longer break or something like this. Should these be part of the TV season, the TV series, or should they be a separate thing? And the same holds true for movies. In a bottom-up process, you can always try to find different layers that represent this, but the fans have made different decisions in the different databases. So for our integration, this becomes problematic as we will have partial mesh matching. Some community might note the Pokemon and the TV animation as a single entry, lots of episodes, and another one might split it up in multiple seasons. And we need to match accordingly, either full or partial, and merge or distribute information in our final representation, the domain. Some observations at the end of my presentation. We notice that the enthusiast groups usually focus on very different aspects of a Japanese visual media domain. They create very detailed models that are well-designed and share a set of core entities. This similarity in their approach to modeling the domain makes it easy and possible for our project to merge the information into a more complete representation of the domain. We still see a lot of challenging work ahead of us 
for the different rep representations of media works in our sources. Thank you for your attention. And if you're interested, you can also see our data and use our data in its current state. We have a project blog and a linked open data service where you can browse all the linked open data from our project using the following links. Thank you. Thank you very much. So actually quite interesting. And I found that uh, Jinha's talk is about the power of fans. And also the mangas talk about the power of fans. And also the linked data, linked open data, is a common basis to connect the things. OK, then let me move on to the last panelist, Sean Petty. Yes, thank you. you. I have a um, <clears throat> video here. I'll get started. I'll try to transition smoothly to uh, screen. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Patia, and I'm an adjunct instructor at Kent State University, where I teach courses on digital technologies for the School of Information. And as a graduate student at Kent, I created the comic book ontology as part of my thesis, which is an open licensed linked data vocabulary for describing comic books and collections. Over the last several years of maintaining the ontology, I've received several requests for enhancements and questions about implementation, most of which have been regarding the sequence model or how the ontology models comics content. And those questions and projects inspired me to begin thinking more about the potential in modeling this type of content specifically the potential in enhancing the metadata for comics related to healthcare or graphic medicine. In this presentation, I'll briefly introduce the concept of graphic medicine, as well as the structure of comics content in general, including the opportunity to better connect it to healthcare-related linked open data resources. I'll also give a brief overview of a limited pilot study that explored this idea, focusing specifically on comics content related to mental health. And I will wrap up with some examples of the types of query this approach enables, as well as challenges and potential directions for future research. So comics and graphic novels are a visual and engaging medium. The text and images work together to create meaning that neither convey alone. And in addition to tales of fantasy and adventure, comics can also share personal stories of health and illness. These works are sometimes referred to as graphic medicine, the intersection of comics and healthcare and use of comics in patient and caregiver education to help explain complex medical topics or to provide insight into the patient experience for healthcare providers, enhancing both empathy and communication. However, the metadata describing these works may lack references, references to medical subject headings or descriptions of the narrative content itself, which can illustrate specific symptoms, treatments, or side effects. Subjects that overlap with other health conditions and experiences, including topics related to mental health. The process of semantic enrichment using linked open data offers an opportunity to enhance the description and discoverability of this content by creating connections to common healthcare vocabularies and ontologies. The implementation of linked open data in the description of graphic medicine can be particularly impactful in bridging these areas of study and practice as data that is freely available with an open license on the web, provided using common protocols, formats and identifiers, and linked to other data, specifically open tools and technologies that are not vendor or domain specific or proprietary, making the approach accessible to all interested parties, both in comics and medicine, an intersection of comics and healthcare, not only in content, but also in the metadata. Often, however, when talking about the accessibility and dynamism of comics, it is easy to forget that not everyone reads comics, so I wanted to give a brief, simplified overview of how comics content is structured. Comics use a sequential narrative with the story unfolding in sequence across one or more pages, and then within one or more ordered panels. These panels may include dialogue and speech balloons and thought bubbles, or captions that contain narrative text. Stories can also be serialized across titles and even across decades with complex story arcs often collected in trade paperbacks or graphic novels. And of course, some work is exclusively published in graphic novel format, with many of these stories following a chapter-based structure similar to a traditional novel. 
Knowing the structure of comics content, we can map these visual components to the sequence model found in the comic book ontology. The ontology can be used to describe titles and contributors and so on, but its sequence model is particularly useful for modeling content which includes classes and properties like story, page, and panel. It incorporates schema.org as an upper ontology, subclassing creative work, or creating equivalencies with comics-related elements where appropriate. This mapping of narrative content to the comic book ontology allows comics content to be expressed as an RDF graph and linked to other data. <clears throat> now, with this ability to create RDF graphs of comics content, I wanted to explore enriching that data using healthcare-related linked open data resources, specifically for comics related to mental health. And this very limited pilot study focused on a single work, States of Mind, a personal memoir of bipolar disorder, a common mental health condition that shares symptoms and experiences with other illnesses. Bipolar disorder is typically characterized by mood swings, or very low periods of depression, and very emotionally high periods called mania. During manic periods, which feel good compared to depression, a person with this mental health condition may have limited insight into the disorder and its effects, which can cause challenges with adherence to treatment and compliance with medication, including presumably graphic medicine. However, comics that share stories of mental health, illness, and recovery can also help subvert typically stigmatizing representations found in other media, including negative portrayals that may influence the perspective of caregivers. This dual effect of both educating patients and building empathy in caregivers makes mental health narratives like states of mind particularly valuable resources and good candidates for semantic enrichment. <clears throat> semantic enrichment refers to the process of adding topical metadata to content so that machines can make sense of and build connections to it. This strategy has successfully been implemented by libraries, archives, and museums to improve the discoverability and reuse of their data. And it has also been previously applied to comics, using automated methods to identify digital comics content and add semantic annotations. The semantic enrichment process can be applied not only to descriptions of the work, but also the content, including detailed indexes found in community or fan-created data a tradition in the comics community, both in print and on the web. This limited pilot study builds on these approaches in three phases, reviewing existing metadata, indexing and analyzing content, and then finally creating enriched metadata from the results. To begin this limited review of the existing metadata, we can start with a typical public library mark record. Here we see bipolar disorder in the summary, as well as subject headings for manic depressive illness, and terms for both comics and graphic novels. We would definitely find this work in a search for comics or graphic novels about bipolar disorder, but we are missing references to medical subject headings, as well as references to the narrative content, including specific symptoms, treatments, side effects, and so on. Next in this RDF record from WorldCat, we again see headings for both manic depressive illness and bipolar disorder, as well as comic books including terms in both English and French, with states of mind being a translation from French. However, again, we are missing references to healthcare vocabulary and descriptions of the content. Finally, moving beyond library data and into the community data, this is an HTML representation of a record from the Grand Comics Database, an internet-based project for cataloging and indexing comics. And here we see that the Grand Comics Database schema does support indexing content or sequences like chapters and stories. And we do see some additional healthcare terms in the keywords and synopsis for this chapter. We can build on this approach by using semantic enrichment to extend these detailed indexes and include both pages and panels, then link that content to healthcare vocabularies and ontologies using linked open data. To begin the indexing and analysis process, we need a template to structure the data and a domain model to map to. Once again, we can use the sequence model from the comic book ontology, specifically classes and related properties for comic story page and panel. We add a column in the template representing each class and create a hash or fragment identifier for each relevant page or panel as we read through each chapter. Also adding a note in the label column describing what each indexed item is about. Now with a complete index of relevant content in our template, we need to find an appropriate identifier for each term. 
we can use BioPortal, a repository of biomedical ontologies, to search for equivalent terms in common healthcare vocabularies and ontologies. BioPortal can also be used to evaluate the license of each vocabulary and review links to other data sources using the class methods feature. And finally, we can use a script to convert the data collected in our template to RDF triples. I'll skip the technical details of the script itself, but all scripts, data, and templates referenced in this presentation are available on GitHub. Very briefly, the script iterates over each row in the template, creating a triple for each value and producing a graph. The graph data can then be serialized to a specific data format, and here we have encoded this graph using JSON-LD, a common way of creating linked data using JavaScript. We see a portion of our graph representing a panic attack, with this panel linked to a specific term in a medical dictionary, which we can see now in both the graph diagram and in the code. This semantic enrichment process resulted in an index of 76 pages or panels illustrating topics relevant to mental health, with links to a total of 37 terms found in 11 healthcare ontologies, potentially now enhancing the discoverability of this content for specific medical terms. This approach is also multilingual, with comics being primarily visual, it does not require a direct translation of text, and it is applicable to non-traditionally published work like crowdfunded or self-published material. In other words, the library data is not a prerequisite. There are, of course, several limitations to this approach. Indexing analysis can be subjective and would benefit from editorial review, and the accuracy of term selection requires review by domain experts. Finally, instead of looking at the output of this pilot study as a bunch of triples, we can instead explore the results in a visualization of our graph. And here we see all of the relevant content and states of mind produced by the semantic enrichment exercise to the individual chapters, pages, and panels. So this graph is a little hard to read, so we can also zoom in. And here is a visualization of the same graph data, but grouped by chapter including references to healthcare vocabularies and ontologies describing their contents. The orange notes here representing links to BioPortal, the same orange dots from the linked open data cloud we saw at the beginning of the presentation. Also at the edges, we see the labels for each subject, some of which may be specific to bipolar disorders, but many like panic, stress, and anxiety that are shared with other mental health conditions. So I want to wrap up with just a few examples of the types of queries this approach enables. First, we have panic attack. So the same image we've been looking at throughout the presentation, but I think worth noting since it is a great illustration of a common symptom and experience. And next, an example of a compound query. So combining both onset and mental disorder. The value, of course, being in the surrounding narrative, but I believe a good data point and example. Next, an example of a query for a specific medication or a side effect. And here we see mention of the antipsychotic tercian, which does not get translated from French to English in the text. However, the entry we are looking at or linking to in the National Drug Data File does contain both terms in both languages. And finally, blood lithium level. So here we have a more specific term related to bipolar disorder, but differing, pers differing perspectives of the same scene. So as the patient getting their blood tested, but also as the provider testing blood levels in an effort to adjust medication dosage. And these differing reader perspectives hint at some of the challenges, specifically in the case of graphic medicine, can we represent different perspectives and usages adequately in the metadata? Regarding future research and directions, an application profile with specific recommendations may be the most obvious step, next step especially for enhancing interoperability between similar efforts. However, I think completing this exercise of semantic enrichment at scale is more of a usability problem. The technical capability is well established. We are completing this enrichment process in an open world, open web sense. So we are not modifying existing data sets, rather creating new graphs or knowledge that can be merged with other examples. So how then to enable contributions from non-metadata experts across several areas of practice? I think the ultimate goal of this pilot study may be to inform the design of a system that better facilitates or even automates to some degree this process, or rather uncovers a more effective path to extending these community indexes and connecting that content 
to healthcare-related vocabulary and ontology. So here's just a list of the ontologies referenced in the pilot study. Again, all can be found in BioPortal, including the licensing information. And finally, my contact information and links to both the ontology and pilot study, which includes the data, templates, and scripts referenced in this presentation. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, quite an interesting talk. Yeah. Thank you. Kind of the uh, comics as a medicine. That was quite impressive for me. Okay, so the we have done the four presentations. And so the, actually, I enjoyed this panel a lot. So the, from the BTS to mental health, and also the, from fun-created detailed database to I'll say the public sector created database. So that covers quite a big area. And uh, we need to discuss more. And please join tomorrow's I'll say, panel and workshop event sessions. OK, thank you very much. And let me close this session. Thank you again. OK, then finish. We'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. See you all tomorrow again. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.